I pray that your Holy Spirit would be powerful here in this place, that you would be the great teacher and counselor, and you would speak just to each person's heart exactly what it is they need to hear. Um, Lord, I sure love you, and uh, you are our hope. And Lord, you never, never leave us alone. You love us as we are, and you are always there, and you are our hope. And so remind us, Lord, every day of those things. We sure love you in Jesus' name, amen. John 8, verse 25 says, so they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and, what I, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. We talked about this last week. Basically, he's saying, do you still not get it? Well, do they want to get it is the question. Um, they're not asking questions to gain um, knowledge. We know that because he has said, I have told you, who am I? I'm exactly who I've been telling you all along. And so they're not asking questions to gain knowledge. They are asking questions to consistently lay a trap for Jesus. Questions like, where is your father? Will he kill himself? Do you remember that question? Who are you? Um, and then he says, I have told you who I am from the beginning. You are refusing to hear. And then he says, I love it, he says, I have much to say about you. Can you imagine all that he could have said? Scripture says there is nothing that is not laid bare before the Lord. He could have gone on, and, by, and basically his judgments are correct. He said, I have much to say about you, but I didn't come here to do that. I came here to only speak the words my Father has given me. And I kept thinking about even when Jesus was writing in the sand with his finger, right? Here they have brought in this adulterous woman, and in order to protect the law, they say, they literally destroy a life, and they shame her in public, and Jesus immediately by his posture shows that he loves this woman, and he gets down and starts to write in the sand. And we talked about how that Greek word, um, according to the context, suggests that Possibly he is making an accusation back. And so we, we laughed and said, oh, maybe he wrote their name and someone else's name. Maybe he wrote a date and a room, hotel room number, you know, who knows, or a website. But do you realize that he still wrote it in the dust? The wind could have come by and brushed that away. They still had every opportunity to come to know the Lord. Yet here they were. They were wanting not only to write what she had done in stone, but literally pick up the stones and kill her for what she had done. And Jesus is saying, really? I could have much to say about you. And when I do, it is correct. Because he is the good judge. But he said, I didn't come to do that. I did not come into the world to condemn the world, but I came into the world that the world might be saved. I came to shine the light and to speak what the Father has told me. And each person will make the judgment. They will either come into the light or they will walk back into the darkness. And they are showing time and time again by their refusal to hear and believe that they have made a judgment. They're not interested in who he is. They're laying a trap. And he says... Um, he says, so when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I, am, I do nothing of my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. That word lifted up, remember we talked about it, doesn't mean necessarily exalt here. It means to lift up on a cross. Like the Son of Man will be lifted up as the bronze serpent. And so he's talking about his death. And he says, when everything is completed, when I have done all that the Father has asked me to do, and I have been lifted up, and I have died and risen again. Trust me, all will know. Now, does that mean instantaneously? Well, we know some knew right away because Jesus appeared to his disciples. Uh, maybe someone knew during the earthquake or the splitting of the veil, but he appeared to all kinds of people afterwards. And people became aware at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit convicted them. And along the way, people are becoming aware. But at the end of time, what will happen? Everyone will know. 
He's like, when all of this is complete and all said and done and the Son of Man has been lifted up, all will know that what I am saying is true. Why? Because we know that scripture says at one day, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I don't know about you, but I want to bow voluntarily, not mandatorily. But we will all hit our face before the Lord because he is exactly who he said he was. And he said, and it will be known. In verse 29, it says, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you, truly, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hmm. He said, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Uh, in John 16, 32, it says that. It says that when this happened, talking about the lifting up or the crucifixion, he says, all of you will be scattered. Was that true? Yes. He said, but my father, my father is with me. And it's also not the fact that just his father was with him in the crucifixion, but the fact is his father has been with him from the start all along. Eliot's com uh, Ellicott's commentary says this, he was ever conscious of a presence which they knew not of, but which the future would reveal to them. So he is saying the words, for I always do what my father has asked, that gives the reason for the presence of God. There was no separation between the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of his father. Why? They were always in communion because he submitted to the will of the father. He was always obedient. In his human nature, perpetual communion is conditioned by perpetual obedience. And can I tell you, he is the only one that can claim that. Why? Well, remember, he is the second man born a virgin. He is both humanity and God. He is both physical and spiritual. And he did what Adam could not do. He submitted the flesh to the will of the Father completely, fully unto the cross as a perfect sacrifice. There was never separation. There was perfect communion. And that's what he's saying. My father has never left me. We have perfect communion because I have come and I have been obedient to all that he has said. And he is the only one that can claim that. And matter of fact, the father backs him up. Do you remember when he gets baptized? And he says, this is my son. In him, I am satisfied. He is the perfect substitute. But for us, Romans 3, 23 says what? You know that one? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't have that. <laughs> I love the fact that not even the Pharisees could argue with him. Not even, because he continually said to them, if you have found a flaw, if you have found something to accuse me of, let me have it. But the fact is, they never did. Nothing impeded or blocked his fellowship. It goes on to say that many believed. Now in that, it says many believed, but then Jesus says some kind of harsh words after it says many believed in him. It says Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. Do you see the difference a little bit there? It says many believed in him. But then he turned and he said to the Jews who had believed him. He says this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And so I think this goes hand in hand with the parable in Matthew 13 three through nine, the parable of the, the seed being sown and the different types of soil. Um, if you're not familiar with that, go read the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. But he is saying, you know, some seed, the seed's the seed. The seed is the word of God. And some seed falls on perfect soil and it, it grows root and it, it has root and it grows. Others, you remember, 
It was shallow, and right away they got swept up in emotion, and it seems that they sprout real fast, but then there really are no roots, and so when the things of the sun shines, it scorches them, and, and it's this whole idea of that you kind of have three groups of people at this time. You have the ones who don't believe, and then you have the true disciple, and then you have a not true disciple, and how do you tell? It's in that word abide, to remain What is the evidence of a true disciple? That they will remain. Matter of fact, I think John, I want to say in the New Testament, the word abide is used something like 34 times, and it is John that uses it 31 of those. And so a huge theme in John is about remaining, abiding. And he says, if you abide in my word, do you notice that that is singular? It doesn't say if you abide in my words. If you abide in my word. What does that mean? It is the sum of all that he has taught. Now think about it. What are the things that he has said along the way? I listed out some for you. I am the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If he believes in me, I will make his heart as rivers of living water. I am not of this world. The Father and I are one. I am the resurrection and the life. John says, these things I have written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing him, you would have life in his name. So when it says, abide in my word, it means the completion of everything he has taught about himself and about the kingdom. He is saying, if you abide in my message, and it's even more than that. It is not only that you're abiding in his message, but do you realize that he is the completion of his message? And that is why you'll see it go back and forth. So right here he says, my true disciple will abide in my word. But then you get to John 15 and it says what? I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man abides in who? In me. And so you have this idea that he's talking about his entire message and he is the fulfillment of his message. And so he is basically saying, my true disciple will abide in me. Man, do I understand that. You've heard um, my story of, you know, the anger I have dealt with at God. And um, one of the lines that is in my Mother's Day message is this, I ended up at a point where I had an agony I could not deny, I could not escape, and a faith I could not deny. Can I tell you how hard it is to be there? <laughs> but the fact is, I could be mad at him, I can question him, I can do all this stuff, but like Peter, I look and say, well, where would I go? You have the words of life. Do I know everything? Am I okay with everything? Do I not want to know why about some things? All of that, that's fine. But the bottom line at the end of the day, if you are fully convinced that his message is true and he completed all that he said he was, at the end of the day, the true disciple, no matter how they feel, no matter what emotions rise and fall, at the end of the day, you are fully convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor things present nor things to come, you get my drift? will separate me from the love of God. And at the end of the day, even in the middle of your pain, you will abide. I don't know, Lord. I don't know what you're doing. I don't understand a lot of things, but I'm gonna hang on to you for dear life. And isn't that what Jacob basically did? His whole life, he ran after an image. That's what he did. He ran after an image of what he needed to be, what he wasn't for his father, obedience to his mother, this image, this con man, to get what he needed. He put on whatever image he needed to get what he wanted, and eventually God said, we need to handle this, and they wrestled. And at the end of the day, God had to pop his hip out, right? He, he had to learn. He had to surrender, but at the end of the day, what did he say? I'm gonna hang on to you, dang it. It says he hung on to him until God blessed him. In other words, I'm just hanging on for dear life because I believe you are it. And that's it. We all have to come to that point. It's okay to wrestle with God, but we hang on. Those who abide are his true disciples. 
And he tells him in verse 24, didn't he? He basically said this, and this is the whole reason. Back in 24, he says this. He goes, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. It comes down to the fact that you have to believe my word. You have to believe what my message, and you have to believe that I am the completion of that message. And if you do not believe that, if you do not put your faith in that, you will die in your sins. Why? Because you held on to that instead of giving it to me. And because of that, you cannot be where I'm going. He gave him every opportunity. Look at verse, thir- uh, it says here, verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I find that interesting. You'll see that at a lot of academic institutions. I think you see it at a lot of uh, legal um, institutions in our government, uh, you know, this whole idea of, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, only if you know what that truth represents, okay? We're not talking about academic truth. We're not talking about worldly wisdom. We're not talking about relative truth. Your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. No, he is talking about an absolute truth. And it's very interesting, because if you compare that verse with verse 36, look what that says. It says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let me read those two back to back. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So who is the truth that sets you free? Well, here it says, it is the Son. The Son sets you free, and when you're free, you're free. And when he does that, you're free indeed. And so the truth, right, is an absolute truth because it's absolutely in a person. And he claimed to be that. I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And this is the whole point, that Jesus did not come here to discern between good people and bad people. He came here to discern between the proud and the humble. Those who would receive his message and humbly realize that they need a savior and that they would believe that message and bow the knee and accept this gift by faith. To release our pride and in humility, reach our hand out and say, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. Or you would be proud and decide that you wanted to make the way and all you would be left holding on to is you will die in your sins. And you cannot be where I am. It comes down to that at the end of the day. So they answer him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? This cracks me up. They, they make me a nut bag, right? Because how do you feel when you read that? Like, are you kidding me right now? You've never been slaves to anybody? Um, have you forgotten Egypt? You were slaves for 400 years in Egypt and you cried out to the Lord and he rescued you. Uh, through the leadership of Moses and by his mighty right hand and ten plagues, you were freed. And if you think that was enough, they, they had all kinds of trouble. Um, you know, come the judges, they were constantly being oppressed. I could name all kinds of armies, but let's just move on to when, how about the fact of when Assyria came in after the divided uh, kingdom and the Assyrians came in and literally led the 10 tribes of Israel away with hooks in their mouths and scattered them as a nation, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. And then after that, let's not forget the Babylonian captivity when they came in under Nebuchadnezzar and they took the cream of the crop at the beginning and took them to Babylon and eventually uh, took captives to Babylon where they stayed for 70 years. And then they were under the Persians And then the, you know your world history? And then the Greeks, the whole issue with Antiochus Epiphanes who was determined he would Hellenize them and at one point he offered a pig on their altar and stuffed pork down their priest's throat until Judas Maccabeus rose up and brought their freedom for a time. And then, currently, who are they under right now? (laughs) The Romans. And so... You want to look at them and go, okay, what? 
But they're saying, what do you mean we will be free? We are free. Oh, really? Look around, because politically you're under the Romans. And spiritually? Spiritually, you're slaves to sin. So actually, you're not. Verse 34, it says, Jesus answered them, truly, truly. What does that mean? This is serious, serious. Okay, listen. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. Mm. He says, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. I don't know about you, but I didn't have to practice that real hard. Did you? I kind of had it down from the beginning. Why? Because we don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are by nature sinners. Okay, that is the A block of what we need to know about humanity. And if we don't believe, if we don't believe that the same, then our theology will never match up. We are broken, we are dead in our sins, we are alive physically, and we are dead spiritually. He says all those who practice sin are slaves to sin, and he says basically you are a slave. Slaves don't remain in the house forever. Slave, a slave has a temporary place in the family. They are claiming because they are the offspring of Abraham that they are already in God's family. And Jesus is saying no. Actually, you're slaves to sin. You're only a temporary member. The son is permanent. And it is the son who must ultimately set you free. Does that make sense? Did they set themselves free from Egypt? God set them free through someone he sent on their behalf. And they're always talking about Moses. But they are slaves to sin. Someone needs to set them free. God heard our cry, and he did, but he sent his son to set us free, who became the Passover lamb to die in our place. He's like, no, unless the son sets you free, you are not free. You're a temporary. He says this, you may be his, look at verse uh, 37, you may be his offspring, do you see that term there? But not his, in verse 39, what does he say? but not his children. He's like, okay, no. You are physically from Abraham, yes, because you're Jewish. But you are not his children. He's saying, because I do what I see my father doing. You do what you hear from your father. He's saying, no, sons will emulate their fathers. I do what I see my father doing. That tells you that he actually sees the father, this close connection, um, this communion between the son and the father. I think it's interesting. He says, but you do what you have heard from yours. That kind of lets us know that there is an influence that they have from their father that they themselves may not be aware of. And we're going to figure out real quick who he is going to say their father is. It's going to be, it'll be appalling to them. But he's saying, no, you may be the offspring of Abraham, but if you were actually Abraham's children, that means spiritual, you would do what Abraham did. And Abraham did not do what you're doing. How do I know that? Well, one reason is you want to kill me. And Abraham in the scripture was called the friend of God. And matter of fact, Abraham did the opposite of what you're doing. He actually believed God. In Genesis 15, 6, when Abraham is told of the promise, all right, he says, and Abraham believed God, and it was given to him as righteousness. He accepted God's word by faith, the word that he could comprehend, the word looking forward to the cross, he believed God, and it was given to him as righteousness. Not only that, in Genesis 18, do you remember? He received God's emissaries. Do you remember that? 
that the Lord and two angels show up to him to tell him what will be happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember this? He received them. He believed them. He spoke to them. He is saying, no, you may be the offspring of Abraham, but you are not his children. Because if Abraham was your father, you would be doing what your father did. What did he do? He believed my words and he accepted the emissaries of God. I am the word. I have come on your behalf and you won't believe me. You seek to kill me. In verse 41, it says, you are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Ooh, they're getting rude. Right? That's what happens when you've made up your mind and you can't prove it. And you just, then you switch to get personal. Right? And so they're like, well, we weren't born of fornication. They're, what are they insinuating? That Jesus was, you know, that Mary had sex with someone and it wasn't Joseph and that whole idea, not realizing, right, this, no. The virgin birth was predicted in the prophets and he is born a virgin. He is fully human and he is fully God. But the funny thing is, they like, no, we have one father and it's God. Can you imagine being Jesus at this moment? Okay, all right. So he's your father? No, he's my father. How do, I, how do we know that? Who emulates him? Yeah. And so Jesus said, mm, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I come not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand why I, what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. I don't know how uh, clearer he could possibly say what he is saying. That he's like, they tell him, um, you know, we have one father, even God. And he's like, nope, not true. If he was uh, your father, you would love me because I came from him. And everything I have said and everything I have done has proven it. And you will not believe. You cannot bear to hear the truth. Why? Because your father is the devil. And from the beginning, he was a deceiver and he was a murderer. Why? Because that is his character. The first deception was in his own heart that he could be like God. And he then spread that deception to mankind. And because of that, and because of sin, he was a murderer. I don't think it's just talking about the first murder of Abel. No, it's talking about the murder of mankind through his deception, through sin. And he says, why do you not recognize the truth? Look how many times he has said this in this chapter. In verses eight, well, in chapter 837, he says this, my words find no place in you. In verse 43, it says, you cannot bear to hear. In verse 46, it says, they do not believe. And in 47, it says, they do not hear. Think if you go back to this chapter with your highlighter, you will be shocked how many times he refers to the fact that at the end of the day, they just refuse to believe the truth. Have you ever debated with someone and you had every proof known to mankind and they just look at you and just go, well, well, I just don't believe that. And I go, well, I don't know what else to tell you. You know, I've shown you every proof I know to show you. And to be quite honest, you've shown me nothing. But at the end of the day, you are just unwilling to let it fall on you and believe. And that's what he's saying. And all of that proves chapter 8, verse 12, where he says, and they walk in darkness, and they walk in darkness. 
Because what do we know about the light when he says, I am the light of the world? The light tattles on itself. The light gives itself away. When the light turns on, you don't miss it. It's there. It, is, it proves its own existence when light turns on. The only people that can't see it are the blind. And that is what he is saying. And that's why they will die in their sins. God does not desire to send anyone to hell. He desires, scripture says, for all people to come into repentance and to be saved. It says that he gets no joy out of the death of the wicked. But the fact is, if you refuse that when the light came, the fact is because you will not bow the knee and you will not believe, you will remain in your sins. And because you remain in your sins, or as chapter 3 verse 19 says, you turn and you go back to the darkness because you love the things of the world, then you are not able to be where I am. It is as simple as that. In verse 46, it talks, it says, I have shown you every proof for who I am. Basically, he's like, go ahead, show me. Where have I missed the mark? Name anything you have found in me that does not reflect the Father. Name it. Do you not think for one minute these Pharisees, if they could have come up with one stinking thing, they would have? They are trying all they can to trap him, and they never can. They try to trap him in his words because they can't trap in him attitude or deed or anything that he has shown them. It is evident that he is from the Father, and he's saying, listen, you show me then. You show me where I have missed the mark, and they cannot. I love when, in verse 38 where it says, I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. And the fact is, he is going to tell them, he is saying, whoever is of God hears the words of God in verse 47. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. It just reminds me so much of John 10, 27. My sheep know my voice. Right? They know my voice. And the reason you do not recognize my voice, I'm not your shepherd. Verse 48 says, and the Jews answered him, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Oh, man, they're really getting crazy now. And Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Isn't it amazing how calm he stays? I got mad over the YMCA today. <laughs> Can you imagine if she had sent me, you're a Samaritan, you have a demon? What in the world? Goodness gracious. He's so, oh, to be like Jesus. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. He has an audience of one, doesn't he? Just clearly, that's it. Just absolute confident. He and his father, one. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets, yet you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Oh, my word. Now they're just name-calling. This is ridiculous. He is saying, no, his desire is to honor God. The whole time he's been honoring God and denying who? Himself. The entire time. So you tell me how in the world that would reflect having a demon. Any other demonic situation in the scripture sure didn't look like that. And if you're under the influence of a demon, what would even they agree about? You would see pride and self-seeking. Because that is the character of Satan. That is the character of the demonic. It is definitely not self-denial and honoring God. So they're just, I mean, they're just pulling it out. They're just name-calling is what they're doing. He says, and I love the fact that he didn't even reply about the whole Samaritan thing. He's like, that, that didn't even deserve a reply. They're just throwing out racial slurs, trying to make him into something. He's like, that's, that's so stupid, I'm not even going to answer it. 
But he says, I don't have a demon. I honor my father. The fact is, you don't honor me. And therefore, you don't honor the father. He has said this. Can I show you how many times? I mean, he has said this so clearly. Look at chapter five, verse 22, that we've already studied. That's why he said to them, I'm, not, I'm saying exactly what I've said from the beginning. He never moves off his message, never. 5.22 says this, the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, do you see that that's singular? Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Tell me how that is any different than this section right here. Jesus answered in in 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him, I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. He is saying over and over, I am going to be glorified by the Father. The Father has honored me. He has given me the judgment. He is constantly going on and on with them saying the same message that... um, And this is the one you say is your father. Then look at 56. It says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. This sends him over the edge. Okay? So let's think about this. How did Abraham see the Lord's day? Look at Hebrews chapter 11 real quick. Chapter 11, I'm going to read verse 10 and then 13 through 16. It says, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised. They didn't see the fruition of God's promises. But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, How is that any different for us on this side of the cross? Have we seen the fulfillment of God's promises? No, but we see them from afar, right, by faith. And aren't we also strangers and exiles in this earth? This world is not our home. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Verse 14 says, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. How did Abraham see God? Exactly the way we see him, by faith. He saw it on this side of the cross. We see it looking back. He had a faith. And let me give you some examples. You see, he saw by faith, he saw spiritually. He saw the birth of the Messiah, how? By faith, through the birth of his son, the promised son, Isaac, the one who was promised, but they were dead. Their bodies were dead. They were past the years of having children. So what happened? The Bible shows us that the Spirit of God was breathed into them. We know that. I've taught you before. The Spirit of God, Ruha, the H, the breath, was breathed literally into their names. Sarai was made Sarah. And Abram was made Abraham. And when the Spirit of God breathed into them, they became alive and were able to give birth to this miraculous promised son. By faith, In his spiritual sense, he saw the birth of Messiah through his son, Isaac. What about the crucifixion? Did he see that? Didn't he see that by faith spiritually when he took his son, Isaac, to the region of Moriah 
and they walked up side by side, father and son, Isaac carrying the very wood he would die on, Abraham carrying the knife and the fire, because the son would give his life for our sins, and it is the father who would pour on the wrath. He saw it. He saw it in a spiritual sense, faithfully. And what about the fact that Jesus is our high priest, the idea of this spiritual priesthood? Do you know that Abraham met the priest called Melchizedek that did not come from the Jewish line of Aaron, but it says that he was the priest of the most high God. And he came back from a war and Melchizedek met him and there he had what we would call the Lord's Supper and he gave him a tenth of everything. He saw it by faith with spiritual eyes. And what about even the bride? Do you remember that? The bride, the church, do you think he saw that by faith? Do you remember when he sent Eliezer, his right-hand man, to go find a bride for Isaac? And Eliezer, the one that knew the father and knew the son best, goes, and he goes to a foreign land because Isaac was not allowed to leave the promised land. And he goes and he finds the bride, Rebecca, and basically sight unseen, he tells about the bridegroom and he says, will you marry him? And what does she say? Yes, shockingly. And then he brings her on this journey to come back and to bring her to the bridegroom. Eliezer, the right-hand man, the father's helper, the Holy Spirit, bringing back the bride of Christ. And remember me teaching you that back in Genesis and saying, well, what would you talk about if he was there? And you had just married someone or agreed to marry someone you'd never seen. Wouldn't you want to know about him? Well, what does he look like? Well, how tall is he? Is he kind? Is he a hard worker? I mean, wouldn't you ask? Wouldn't you want to know? And the fact is that by the time she got back, she saw Isaac coming at a distance, and it said she got down off her camel, and she put on her veil because she said, who is that? And he said, that is my master. And automatically, it was like love at first sight, and he whisked her in to his mother's tent who had passed away, and they consummated that marriage. I don't know about you, but I'm on a journey. This is not my home. I am the bride of Christ. The Holy Spirit has been given to me so that I can know all about him. And I don't know about you, but when I see him, I want to be in love. Wouldn't it be ridiculous to go on this entire journey to accept that kind of love offer and know nothing about him? Those who abide in my word are truly my disciples. And they say to him, here's the end of it. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Bottom line, this is not talking relatively of Jesus' age. It's basically saying any rabbi, the, the retirement date was around 50, mid-50s. And they're like, you're not even approaching retirement. How in the world are you saying that you have seen Abraham? And I'm telling you what, he is about to make them a nut. Biggest statement ever, 858. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, you better listen up. This is true, this is true, this is important. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, my word. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out to the temple. And he basically said it. He is not uh, mincing words at all now. He literally says, okay, somehow you have missed this all along. I have told you I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Basically, I am the living water. All of these, and he said, no, I need you to hear me closely. Before Abraham was, I am, and he uses the divine name of God. The name that he gave Moses, I am that I am. And people can say they think he was claiming this or that or the other. I know exactly what he was claiming because the only thing you could claim that would send them this nuts to where they are immediately picking up stones and trying to kill him. He is looking them in the face and he is saying, that I am, that Yahweh, that name that you've been worshiping all along, I am. And so I'm telling you, I don't know how anyone 
could not believe that Jesus claimed to be God and that he claimed to come and die on our behalf, that there can be any other way to salvation, I could send someone to one book of the Bible and, have, and read only eight chapters that we have gone through. How clear has he been? He is clear. There is no middle ground. He is either who he said he was or he's insane. I mean, that is the bottom line. Because no good man, good prophet, good teacher claims to be God unless he is not. There is but one way unto salvation. And he said it to Nicodemus. If you want to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. My disciples, my true disciples, will abide in me. It is all that he has done, nothing that we have done. And we can be assured when he says, all that the Father has given me, I won't lose a one. That is the hope of our salvation. That is the hope. And so we've only done eight chapters. Now you get a summer break. But here's the thing. I've given you a lot of notes over these months. Can't you think of a better way to spend the summer than to literally go back and read through your notes? Don't get out of the habit of having your face in the book. Right? And don't get in the habit of only being able to digest what I've chewed up. You chew. You chew it. Okay? Don't you want to chew your own food? I do. All right? Don't only live on what somebody else has chewed, digested, and given to you. You chew it. I, we have looked at a lot of stuff in the book of John, 1 through 8. You have plenty. Because here's the thing. I am fully convinced. I've spent time in it. I'm fully convinced, are you? Because I'm gonna tell you, in this world you will have trouble. And at the end of the day, when all of the things in this world you feel are being taken from you, at the end of the day, you have to decide what there is to hold on to. This is not our home. It's not. It's not about comfort. It's not about this life. It is about the next. And we are here for a purpose. And that is to be the light of the world. And we need to be that. Um, Also, I want you to know, did I bring books in? If you want uh, some loose controls, the way to find your soul, they're up here with Cindy. If you would like to purchase some of those, uh, summer is a great time to have small groups. You can have them. There are videos to that. You know it. And all you do is facilitate if you have not been through that. If you have even two to three women on your mind, Come and get these books and see about staying in the word. That will help them understand that there are Bible studies available to them. Do you know how many people I run into? They have no idea this is going on. And we need to spread that word. And we need to spread the word to uh, some younger women who are in the throes of raising those kids. And see if we can't get them in there. And this is a great way to do it. All right? Before I pray, do you have any questions for me? How much of you love the book of John? Awesome. Awesome. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Lord, that I would be like you, that I would live for an audience of one. God, help me to absolutely shine the light and to love people. Help me to know your word and abide in it. Know the message, believe the message, and spread that with an attitude of love. Um, Lord, I pray that you would be with these women, that you would draw them close, that your Holy Spirit would transform us from the outside and people would, inside out, and people would see that and want to be a part. God, be with us um, as we leave and bring us back next year. You know what? I think I'm going to sing over you. Lord bless you.